Hello, my greetings to you. This video is meant for CBSE students of class 11th. This video presents the first poem from NCRT textbook Hornbill. There is a photograph written by Shelley Tolson. And by the end of this video, you will not only be able to understand the text in a good manner, but you will also be able to form an idea how a literary text should be approached. The very way to understand and to approach a literary text will be provided to you people by considering the sample study of this poem. Now, before I say anything about the poem, a few suggestions about how a literary text should be read. Considering the literary text, the various forms, whether it is poetry or prose, fiction or non-fiction, you should always try to identify certain trends in the literary text. There has to be a message of the writer, author always tries to write with a message, try to identify the message of the text, try to identify the universal idea explored in the text which you usually call theme, try to understand the very style of writing and the form of the literary text. Now let's head towards the poem. Now coming towards the biography of the poetess Shirley Tolson, she was a British author born in UK, died in the very same country. As far as the dates of birth and death are concerned, they are not very important for you people. You can't memorize them, no issues. Just remember one thing about the poetess and that is many of her works, they show autobiographical elements and this poem, a photograph, it's no exception. I meant to say that there are autobiographical elements in this poem as well. Now, before we come towards the text of the poem, just a preface for you people. In this preface, there will be many points discussed about the poem and they are very important to you people because you should be having an eye for them when you come towards the text of the poem. You should be vigilant to identify these points in the poem. As far as the length is concerned, it's not a very long poem. It's just made of 19 lines. There are three stanzas in the poem. As far as the verse is concerned, the form of verse used in the poem is pre-verse. Now, two characteristics you have to remember about uh, the pre-verse. The first characteristic is no rhyme scheme used. And the second characteristic is there is no meter used in the poem. Now, what I mean by the meter, the simple thing to identify for you people here will be that you will be able to see the size, the length of the lines is variable. I mean to say, some lines they are very long, while the other lines they are very short. That is what is actually indication for the pre-verse, that there is no usage of meter. Those lines of poetry which have got same meter, they have similar length, because the number of stressed and unstressed syllables in such lines is equal it's similar so just memorize two points about the previous the first thing is that it does not have any kind of rhyme scheme and the second thing is it does not have any meter in it now coming towards the genre of the poem as far as the genre the form is concerned it's an incidental narrative i mean to say this means that this poem is written on an incident a happening and that happening has been narrated so definitely there is going to be some narrator some speaker in this poem and the speaker of this poem is an adult person probably the poetess herself she is because this poem it has an autobiographical element in it as i have told you people from the very inception that this writer shirley tolson many of her works they show autobiographical hints in them Considering the mode of the poem, the mode of the speaker, the speaker in this poem is actually in nostalgia. Nostalgia means reminiscence. Reminiscence means recollecting the past. The speaker tries to recollect the memories from the past and in that state the person is in contemplative mood. I mean to say that the person is in deep thinking mood. Concerning the tone, it's nostalgic and sad. At the beginning of the poem, we find that the poetess is in deep contemplative mood. The poetess thinks about the past. As she recollects the past, there comes a sad memory from the past. And that sad memory actually makes her feel sad. Sadness creeps in 
later on at the beginning there is just nostalgia there is just recollection of the past and then the recollection of the past breeds sadness that brings in the sadness so there definitely is a shift in the mood from nostalgia to sadness subject simply means what the poem is all about the speaker the persona the poetess finds an old photograph that old photograph shows her mother as a child of 12 years old along with two of her cousins that old photograph opens the gate to a flood of memories for the poetess and she records them in the poem that's what the poem is all about there are three major themes in the poem the first one is death the second one is mortality of human beings versus immortality of nature all the things of nature survive for a long time they do not rather come to an end they are immortal but human beings they are mortal they are ephemeral the life is brief the third theme is the theme of mutability or the changeability the poem seems to deliver the message that recalling the old unhappy incidents lead to sadness what unhappy incidents of past can give you is sadness only therefore you should always try to forget the unhappy incidents of the past remember bad memory is the tonic of happy life now here we also find that the idea of moving on in life is being suggested so the message to move on in life from the sad incidents or the mishappenings is the message of the poem my suggestion to you is if ever past knocks at your door do not open your door because past after all does not have anything new to offer to you people now before we come towards the literary devices or the poetic devices used in the poem i'm serving you people a reminder here that this is very important for you people to understand therefore i wish to seek your full attention here the first poetic device used is transferred epithet transferred epithet is a complex term which is made of two words try to understand the meaning of these two words and you will be able to understand what this poetic device means the first word is transferred transferred simply means taken from one place to another shifted transferred from one place to another while epithet simply refers to title what is title title is simply an adjective adjective is a word which describes the characteristic of a person a place or a thing now you know what happens in poetry sometime the authors the poets they deliberately they knowingly consciously try to take out an adjective from a person or a place where it suits the most and use it for another person or place where it does not suit and that is said to be the transferred epithet we'll talk about it later when we will come to the text the second poetic device used is synecdoche synecdoche is a device in which a part stands for whole or whole stands for part let me serve you people an illustration here suppose i say my hand is mortal my hand is transient transient simply means mortal which comes to an end which is brief which survives or lives for a very short period of time when i say my hand is mortal that means my hand will come to an end but this hand is actually a part of body and when i say this hand is mortal that means the whole body is mortal when i say my hand is mortal that means my whole body is mortal and i will die some day my body will come to an end some day now what is hand hand is only a part part of what part of my body right when i say my hand is mortal that means my whole body is mortal so hand is representative of whole body hand stands for whole body right so synecdoche is being used when somebody says hand is mortal meaning that the whole body is mortal the person itself or himself or herself is mortal the next thing is a poetic technique called alliteration alliteration is a technique in which the first letter of different words of a line is repeated with an objective to lay stress or to emphasize or highlight certain key words now there should be no gain saying the fact that letters are of two types vowels and consonants 
and accordingly alliteration is of two types two when the letter repeated at the beginning of different words in a line is consonant the technique or the type of alliteration is called consonance while the repetition of the vowel letters at the beginning of different words in a line can be said or can be called as an assonance if the examples of the two are written on your screen now we are coming towards the textual analysis you should try to keep your text close to you for this the poem is divided into three stanza and the three stanza depict three different phases the first stanza is the smallest one and it describes the childhood days of the poet's mother when she was only 12 years old the poem begins when the poetess or the narrator finds an old photograph and starts looking at it which opens the gate to a flood of memories the photograph shows three persons the first person is the poet's mother who can be seen at the center of the photograph she is the tallest of the three persons shown in the photograph the two other persons shown in the photograph are two of her cousins the two cousins of the poet's mother i mean to say and both the cousins they can be seen at the right and left of the poet's mother the poem begins when the poetess says the cardboard shows me how it was remember the choice of words in this poem is very deliberate the poet has consciously used word cardboard in place of photograph in the first line of the poem this is very deliberate on the part of shillet olson she has used this word cardboard in place of photograph just to emphasize just to stress just to lay importance on the fact that the photograph was actually very old and it was not very clear it was blur remember the photograph shows how it was when the two girl cousins of the poet's mother they had gone to the beach to celebrate their holiday along with the poet's mother so the poetess says that the poet's mother was the tallest she was the eldest of the three girls therefore she is described as the big girl she says at that time her mother was only 12 years old the three girls had gone to the beach in order to paddle in order to celebrate or in order to get involved in the recreational activities but remember the three girls they were not alone there there was somebody else also with them who was that person that person was their uncle and the uncle was actually there with a camera and the three girls they were preparing themselves they were making a pose they were standing at one place only they were still they were not moving and they were smiling through their hair perhaps making a pose for the photograph to be clicked by the uh, uncle so the uncle had clicked the photograph which was available for the poetess at that time to see which opened the flood of memories for her on seeing at the photograph the poetess finds that the face of her mother was very sweet at that time but the poetess also tells us that the photograph was taken actually very long ago when the poetess was not actually born no up till now we had seen only nostalgia we had only seen a recollection of memories from the past and this was perhaps not very sad this was perhaps a bit happy as well but now the sadness will creep in in the second last line the poetess says that there is something else also seen in the photograph remember the three girls are not the only things which can be seen in the photograph there is something else and you know what that's another thing is which can be seen in the photograph that is the water of the sea the sea can also be seen the beach the water of the sea can also be seen in the photograph and the poetess says that this water of the sea it was it was seen touching the feet of the three girls but remember this water of the sea it appeared to have changed very less the poetess here just tries to highlight the idea that the things of nature they survive forever while the human beings they come to an end with the passage of time remember the theme of mortality of human beings versus the immortality of the things of nature has been introduced here at this point in the poem the sea appears to be changed less simply it means that the sea was not changed at all time had no effect on the sea 
The last line of the stanza is very important for you because two literary devices are used in this line. The line reads, washed their terribly transient fit. The first thing used in the line is synecdoche. You remember here the poetess says that the water of the sea was touching the fit of the three girls. And now remember the fit of these three girl, three girls is are described as transient. Transient simply means ephemeral, short-lived, brief, that which dies, the one that is mortal. The fit of these girls, they are described as mortal. But remember, fit, they are only part of their bodies. The bodies as a whole will come to an end, meaning that these girls, they are mortal. They will die and their feet, they are said to be transient, meaning that their bodies are transient. Feet, only a part of the body, referring to the whole body of these three girls, definitely is a synecdoche. The second technique used in this very line is transferred epithet. You see here, the feet of this girl, they are actually described as terrible. Terribly they are. They are transient. But how transient they are? They are terribly transient. Terribly means scaringly. They are frighteningly transient. Now, do you think that the feet can be scaring? The feet can be frightening. In fact, the sea is frightening. The sea can claim the life. Therefore, it is fatal. It is actually terrible. But this adjective, which could better be used for the sea, which could better suit when used for sea, it has been transferred from that place. It has been transferred from the sea and it has been used for the feet of the girls. And therefore, this is a transferred epithet being used. Now, the second stanza describes second phase. And the phase which it describes is the adulthood of the speakers or the poet's mother. The poetess says that her mother had seen the same photograph which she saw at this time. She had seen, her mother had seen the photograph some 20 or 30 years later. Meaning that, it simply means, uh, remember when was the photograph taken? The photograph was taken when the poet's mother was some 12 years of an age. Now add to that 20 years or 30 years. Meaning that when the poet's mother had seen that photograph, at that time, her mother's age either was 32 or it was 42. So, after seeing at the photograph, she says, my mother laughed. She laughed because she said, lo, look at Betty, look at Dolly. Who are Betty and Dolly? Betty and Dolly actually are the names of the two cousins who had been with the poet's mother on that day at the sea beach. She says, look. Look at them, how they were dressed, the way they were dressed, it amused the poet's mother. After recollecting the memory of the childhood, the poet's mother was very happy. She laughed. The poetess remembers all this. Then the poetess once again grows sad. She says, she says that both of us, we have suffered a loss. My mother, she suffered a loss. At the time when she looked at the Photograph, she had suffered the loss of her childhood. She was no more young. She was old at that time. She was adult at that time. And she was recalling her childhood days. The good old days of the childhood were recalled by her mother. And therefore, she says that my mother was at loss. Now, when I am seeing this photograph at this time, I myself am at loss. She says that my loss is the loss of my mother. My mother's laughter, my mother's Laughter is no more present because she has died, the poetess says. And therefore, both of us, we have suffered a loss. Both the poetess and her mother, they both of them, they suffered a loss. While the loss for the poetess mother was the loss of her childhood, the loss for the poetess is the loss of her mother, her laughter. And the poetess says, both of us, we arrive with the labored ease of loss. Remember, this line is very important for you. Once again, it in, I just would like to invite all your attention here in order to understand this line because one poetic device once again has been used in this line. And the poetic device used in this line is oxymoron. Remember what oxymoron means? Oxymoron simply means 
the usage of two distinctly different words just to create a special effect. The poetess here says that it was a labored ease of loss. Both of us, we just tried to forget the loss. Both of us, we were actually depressed. We rye, we were depressed with the loss. Both the poetess and her mother, they were depressed by the loss. But both of them, they tried to forget their losses. They just tried to forget their respective loss. And the poetess says that we had labored hard. We had actually tried. We had tried hard to ease the loss. Remember, labored and then ease. Labored means something hard earned. And then ease is something which comes on its own. Or rather, is sought by a person is taken by a person without much labor. So these two words, they are distinctly different, can be said that an oxymoron has been used here. The third and the final stanza of the poem describes the third phase, which comes after the death of the poet's mother, when the poetess is very sad. The poetess says that her mother has been dead now as many years as she had lived in the photograph. Now remember, just try to recall how old was the poet's mother when the photograph was clicked. She was 12 years or so. So this simply means that now nearly 12 years have passed after the death, after the demise of the poet's mother. And that is what actually makes the poet very sad. The poetess says that whenever I think about the circumstances, whenever I think about these situations, they make me very sad. The poetess says that her mother's silence silences her. The last line of the poem is highly poetic because here we find the alliteration has been used, consonants has been used and this line is beautiful line. A befitting ending for an excellent poem where the poetess says that the silence of her mother has silenced her meaning that she is not able to express her grief in the form of words and therefore she has decided to put an end to her poem. Remember sometimes language will not be strong enough to express your feelings. Sometimes you will not be able to express your feels in words. Sometimes the language fails to express what a person feels. That is what holds good for Shirley Tolson also here and therefore the poem comes to an end. With that we end this poem. You take good care of yourselves. We will meet soon through another video on the next poem. Thanks for watching people.